Okay, hello and welcome to the latest edition of Labor Update with the NB Media Co-op. I'm David Gordon Koch, reporting from Moncton, uh, where I am today at the uh, 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 Canadian Union of Public Employees office, actually in Dieppe, uh, with uh, QP New Brunswick President Steve Drost and the President of the Moncton Local of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, or CUPW Local 78, yeah. uh, Lee and Doucette. Uh, thank you both for joining me today. No problem. My pleasure, David. Um, and, you know, I'm going to say right off the bat, uh, the MB Media Co-op is proud to receive uh, support that keeps us running, uh, up and running from organized labor, including from QP and CUPW. And I say that for transparency and also because I think it's a key aspect of the work we're trying to do at the NB Media Co-op, which is to provide a voice or amplify a voice for organized labor that I think often gets overlooked. And that's why we have this show. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's also just mentioning that this was also the week of the American election uh, where we saw Donald Trump uh, return, returning to power. And, and I was just thinking about that on the way over, how uh, it seems like organized labor is one of the main kind of institutions that exist that's kind of standing up against the extreme right and working for the betterment of all, which to me seems like the only way out of this yes. kind of mess that, that we seem to be in. Yeah, I, uh, I would agree with you there, and uh, I do find it um, somewhat, uh, not bizarre, but uh, really concerning uh, to see the right wing, uh, you know, courting labor as much as they do, not only in the States, but also uh, here in Canada, you know, so mm -hmm. it is concerning, mm -hmm. because uh, I do see us as one of the voices of uh, trying to keep governments accountable, regardless of what stripe they wear or color they wear. But uh, we're not here, of course, to talk about uh, the American election today. We'll save that for another time. Um, we're going to talk about labor relations in, in New Brunswick. And first of all, let's talk about the situation, actually a national situation, facing postal workers right now. CUPW is in a position to issue a strike notice to Canada Post. Lynn, uh, uh, what is the biggest issue or biggest issues in negotiations from your perspective? So there's lots of issues in our perspective, uh, our, and, and a lot of people always think that it's, it's the wage, but it's the health and safety, m most of it is the health and safety of our employees that are across Canada. Uh, that's our big issue. Uh, Canada Post is putting in place uh, things that would affect the health and safety of our, our employees. Um, there's some different programs that people don't understand. We talk about SSD, it's separate sort and delivery. Mm -hmm. So if that is done across Canada, uh, the letter carriers are gonna be on the route a lot longer mm -hmm. instead of being inside to sort their mail and then outside. So it puts them in the element longer time. Uh, there's shortage of staff across Canada. So people are doing two or three, four jobs that uh, and, and overtime. There's overtime, some people are working 16 hours a day sometimes uh, without sleeping sometimes for two days. And the Canada Post is saying that they're financially impacted by a lot of uh, a lot of things. We're used to it. Mm -hmm. Every four years, we hear, I, I, I keep on telling my members, we hear the same story, the same novel, the same romance, the same about the financial issue. We understand that there is some financial constraint out there, but that uh, there's a way to change that, and that's going to get mm. some more services offered by Canada Post. Hmm. Actually, why don't we get into that? Because, yes, Canada Post is pleading poverty. Uh, there's this um, latest quarterly report said that they've seen a year-to-date loss of $372 million so far. Uh, but you know the the union has put to put forward ideas over the years, including postal banking, uh, as one thing. Um, I guess you know what are some of the ways that you think that Canada Post could address these financial woes. So there's financial woes exactly. Postal banking is a big one. Uh, it's working in all the countries that have their postal banking that is run by the post office. It's working really good. It's making profits. Uh, there's also senior check-in is what we that's working a lot in a lot of the other post office that have put senior check-in. We have people that are getting the, oh, the population is getting older and older. There's not homes for everyone. So this is a way of we're we're going to every addresses across the country so this is a way mm. to be able to check in every second day or every third day on a senior and we have a bunch of questions to ask them if they're okay if they've taken their medication and so on and so on 
Uh, so th there's different ways that there's also, that they're talking about weekend parcel. We understand and we know mm. that we need to work seven days a week and, and deliver the parcels on the weekend. But Canada Post wants to make all those jobs part-time on the back of the full-time people. And we, the union, will fight for full-time employment. Mm. Um, really interesting what you're saying about parcel delivery because, uh, you know, I think that this reflects the fact that postal delivery has really changed a lot over the years from technological change from mainly letters to parcels and packages where you're competing with uh, these players like FedEx, private industry, and things like that. But, you know, I think that one thing that people don't talk about a lot is how that changes the job for the, for the workers and I guess, you know, the physical uh, uh, strain and, yeah, just talking about how the work has changed uh, so yes, years. the work has changed yeah. over the years, uh, and and when we say the amount of letters have gone down, the amount of first class letters have gone down, mm -hmm. but the amount of doors that were going across Canada has multiplied compared to that. Mm -hmm. So yes, the parcel is a big thing. Uh, Canada Post has always been known as being one of the places that you can send a parcel at a reasonable price compared to the other companies. These big companies are making money on the back of their workers because they're not paying them what they should be paying them. They're not paying them a decent salary. And we think that Canada Post should also go with the parcel and, and concentrate on the parcel. And that is probably why Canada Post, until a year ago, was not calling it losses, they were called an investment. Mm -hmm. So they invested their money, like the government told them to do it, they invested in buildings, they built big buildings. There's a big plant that was just mm -hmm. built in Scarborough. There's a big plant that was just built in Vancouver. Major one in Vancouver. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. so if it, if, if it was so bad at Canada Post that they weren't getting the product, they wouldn't have built these big technical plant in these places. So until a year ago, it was called the future investment of Canada Post. Now they're taking that amount that they invested in these plant and in their fleet, because they bought new electric fleet for across mm -hmm. Canada, and they're saying that it's a loss. And, and mm -hmm. we hear that every time, that it's a year that there's a contract to be negotiated. So we're, we're used of their their, their mm. public, the way they put it to the public. Their rhetoric. Yes. And just one thing I was curious about, you mentioned off the top uh, SSD and the sorting uh, technology or process. Could you, could you elaborate on that? So what, we, what they call SSD is that they ha would have people sorting all the foot walks and the, in, and the walks out there. Mm. And then the, when the letter carrier comes in, it's all ready for him and he goes outside mm. and delivers. So usually a letter carrier will have in between five and a half hours of delivery outside mm. to six hours. There's a inside work to be done for a couple of hours. So it breaks the day that you're not always just on the beaten bat doing 20 kilometers. Mm. We've seen in most of these places that have put in SSD, the so separate sort and delivery, that the walks have gone from 20 kilometers to 30 and 35 kilometers. Mm. And that's just the walking part. Then add the steps, add the doors, add everything else. That they, so it is harder on the body to, to do eight hours of delivery out there where before you had a couple of hours of sort and getting your stuff ready and then six hours or five and a half hours of delivery and the ailment and everything out there. And I'm right in assuming that people are carrying more weight as well because of this packages and whatnot? Yes, so they are carrying more weight. Uh, a lot of places that, that they modernize how we're delivering, they are, that we all have a truck, so, and then you park and loop, what we call park and loop in a, in a section, but uh, the weight is getting very heavy, and where the weight is getting very heavy is with what we call neighborhood mail, or Canada Post calls it neighborhood mail. Uh, everybody else out there calls it flyers. So the amount of flyers and neighborhood mail that Canada Post is accepting and, and given out there has also gone up mm. very tremendously and that weight is very hard on the, mm. on the letter carriers. Mm. And with not being foot walks like we used to have where we used to have the relay boxes that we would pick up, now everything is in the truck and you have to do your park and loop and you can't break your, your, your bundles like you used to, mm. to break. And they also want you to have, when you do the separate sort and delivery, everything is tied off for you before. So 
they, you, they want you to walk with three bundles of mail in your arms and, and try to ha hold a handrail mm -hmm. while you're going up. So, like, the safety of our employees out there is really deteriorating mm -hmm. with this new program that Chemicals has put out. Okay. Uh, well, I want to get into the situation a little more, but first let's go to Steve. First, any, any uh, comment from you on, uh, on what Lean's uh, describing? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I just want to let you know that CUPE New Brunswick, will, uh, we, uh, you know, we're in solidarity with uh, CUPW. Uh, we, our members will join you on the line and we won't be crossing your picket lines, whatever we can do. Uh, much of what Lynn has talked about has been what we've been experiencing time in and time again when our workers are ready to negotiate contracts is that, you know, the government will have lots of money, there will be no particular issues. And um, a lot of people think that, you know, unions, you know, greedy unions, a lot of what we have been fighting for in the last two or three rounds is, in fact, it's safety on the job. Uh, you know, we have a very, you know, there's a shortage of workers, a significant shortage of workers. So not only do we want workers to make a fair living, we want them to have better working conditions, improved working conditions. Those are the two biggies that we have been fighting for many, many years. So we can certainly relate to that. You know, people being expected to do more with less and with less resources or whatever. And governments having all kinds of money to do projects or to support uh, different businesses and organizations, and we have nothing against supporting them. We have really one simple, simple, uh, you know, thought about all of this. All workers deserve to make a decent living and be able to have the tools and the people available and resources to do the job effectively. So certainly we can, uh, you know, understand what uh, Canada, you know, cupped up or CUPW is going through, and uh, we will certainly uh, support you any way that we can. Thank you very much. Okay, and so it, in here in New Brunswick, of course, we've just seen the swearing in of the Susan Holt government following six years of uh, conservative uh, rule. Uh, public sector unions were uh, in conflict, I would say, constantly with the Blaine Higgs government. What do you expect from uh, the new uh, Holt government, Steve? Well, we're expecting, you know, like, we don't expect to get everything, but, you know, we want to start out by, uh, you know, you know, uh, Premier Holt actually had uh, met with all of us, a lot of uh, the labor groups, but met with CUPE actually. We met with all of the opposition leaders and prior to the election and even before the election was called, you know, Susan had got up and spoke very much against certain bills that were being rammed through by the Higgs government and you are correct. It was a continuous attack by him to attack workers' rights and any of the rights that the unions had fought for and they were enshrined in legislation. He reversed a lot of that. So, you know, Premier Holt did, uh, you know, give us her word that if she were to be elected, she would repeal Bill 17. Mm -hmm. And that was the one that was guised as a pension uh, mm -hmm. actual uh, piece of legislation when in fact it was an attack on free collective bargaining because these groups that had their pensions affected by this bill, um, uh, you know, they were actually, they have language in their contracts that it was to be negotiated. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, yes. he was very typical. He rammed through a lot of legislation. Um, and a lot of it had to do with giving government and the employer the advantage and taking the advantage away from workers. So we're really, really optimistic. Um, not only did Susan commit, uh, you know, did Premier, uh, you know, Holt commit to, you know, trying to repeal, or not trying to, she said she would repeal certain mm. acts, but going to look at some of the other legislative attacks that the Higgs government had given us. But she also, you know, we threw at the olive branch and she was really pleased with that. We want to find ways to support her. We want to find ways to work with her to improve labor relations in this province. Because I think the key point to that is uh, Mr. Higgs and his party, they did everything they could to destroy labor relations in this province. So we are cautiously optimistic. We know we won't get everything, but it's certainly, I can tell you, the labor leaders that work for the province of New Brunswick, uh, there was a huge sigh of relief, mm -hmm. you know, during that election. And not only our leaders, but the labor movement as a whole and a lot of our allies said at least we have hope now and and under his government there was no hope i guess it couldn't be much worse than a uh, zero percent wage offer in the middle of the pandemic correct uh which we saw under uh blaine higgs and for uh, listeners and viewers who might not be familiar B bill 17 which you uh, referenced a minute ago uh was uh, passed last uh december i believe yes um and this is legislation that uh forced thousands of uh QP workers into shared risk pensions, which, as you say, labor leaders called this an attack on free collective 
uh, bargaining rights. QP tried to fight this in court. And uh, now, as you say, Susan Holt has, Premier Holt has pledged to you yes. to repeal this. Correct. Okay. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, yeah there was quite a, uh, quite a, uh, a pushback by our members and by the leaders and uh, other unions. Actually, every union in this province uh, came to a meeting in Fredericton because they were saying this is much more than pension, it's much bigger. It's an attack on, you know, workers' charter rights, mm -hmm. individuals' charter rights. So, uh, again, you know, we're really, um, I can't get into the details of that, uh, that's still before the courts. There's still matters before the court, courts under Bill 17, mm -hmm. but um, I think with, uh, you know, if the Premier is committed to, to do what she has promised to do, uh, I think there's a really good chance that we can get on the right track here in this province and start building this province. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the pushback there, and when the bill passed, uh, union members were in the public gallery uh, and made some noise. Yes. Uh, you were there uh, sort of booing the politicians who, who voted for the bill, and uh, as a result, you and two other QP leaders, namely Sharon Tier and Sandy Harding, were banned from not only the legislature building, but the entire uh, block. Uh, is there any indication that ban will be lifted? Uh, Susan Holt uh, also gave her word when we met at the QP office before uh, the rate was dropped that she in fact would, uh, her as well as David Kuhn, as well as Alex White, the three, we met with all of the opposition uh, parties, all three of them said that that was ridiculous and that they would be reversing that ban. Mm -hmm. Again, so we're going to give her time to, uh, you know, she's got a, a quite a quite a mess to walk into and it's going to take her some time to sort it out. We're not expecting everything to happen right away, but again, we are cautiously optimistic that uh, you know we can improve labor relations and that Sharon and Sandy and myself and any union leader will be allowed to attend the legislature because that was just to me an assault on democracy, mm -hmm. you know, a really affront. Uh, you shut out, you try and shut out the labor leaders, right? Mm -hmm. And and we're there representing our members speaking for the 28,000 of us and and they were very upset, and they had every right to be. Um, speaking of pensions, Lean, is, is, are the pensions of po the posties at issue at all? It's, it's one of the issue. Uh, they're not, uh, they don't want to take it away from current employee, but they want to put a new one in place for the future employees, so anybody that would be hired after the date of the, the sign of the contract. Uh, we and get a shared risk pension. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And our pension at Canapos is doing a really good. Mm -hmm. It's so good that uh, the, the government has given them that they had, didn't have to pay their share for the last five, six years. That's how, it's, how good it's doing. Mm -hmm. So to attack a pension that's doing good is ridiculous. And we know what it would mean. It would trickle down that eventually if nobody's paying into the pension that's there now, it would trickle down that it wouldn't be doing good. So yes, it's trying to attack our pension. And again, it, it's like, we pay our part, but Canada Post is not paying their part because it's doing so good. And again, for probably most listeners and viewers are familiar, but we're, we're talking about defined benefit yes. pensions, which give a guaranteed benefit to the worker upon retirement, as opposed to shared risk pensions, which leave it up to the vagaries the of the market, yes. essentially. So, um, yeah, a kind of a long-running issue, uh, sort of a, a, or, um, a long-running kind of struggle for over, over this kind of pensions, often uh, seen governments and employers try to take these away. Um, Can I pick up yeah. on that just a yeah. little bit, just two points that Lynn, as, as well as you have mentioned. Um, I know there was the recent attack on these three, uh, you know, bargaining units that did have pension language. Uh, Higgs, when he was finance minister under David Albert, converted uh, some defined benefit pension plans that were doing very well at the time, and that matter is still before the courts. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, oh absolutely, there's an ongoing case. PIPS is the lead on that, and uh, QP, nine QP locals who are represented by QP National actually have a case that's going to you know, be a charter challenge. They've been fighting that for many, many years. But it also goes to the other point I want to speak to that Lynn had re, uh, referenced, and that is casual workers, mm -hmm. you know, and part-time workers and seasonal workers. And what I've experienced, I've been, you know, a civil servant uh, 32 years before taking this job over in 2021. And we've watched that creep in and creep in and creep out and eliminate a lot of full-time jobs. 
you know, and um, they, and to me, it's just another way of them to try and weaken bargaining units, mm -hmm. weaken the labor movement, or whatever. And uh, and it, and it really has done a number. And we look at the you know the staffing crisis that we're facing. We hear about retention so much now, so much now, so much now. Well, there's a reason for that. People need to have a decent job, be able to take care of their family, and they need real jobs. You know, people can't uh, survive on part time and casual, and then to expect you know, them to come in and have less wages and less benefits than others is simply wrong. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, again, we stand in solidarity with you and I think all of the unions do, like, make sure people can make a decent living, take care of their family and retire with a bit of dignity. Mm -hmm. And yes. I can go on to that because whatever the union fights for, it trickles down to the, the, the rest of, of the population. And, and the perfect example is in 1981, CUPW fought for maternity leave mm. and we were on the picket line for a long time for maternity leave. We finally got it. It trickled down to other union and then it finally trickled down to that people can enjoy a 17 mm. weeks or 26 weeks of maternity leave with EI. So, and same thing, your, your minimum wage, it trickles down from the union fighting. Mm. And, and things like that, your weekend off, your days off, not having to work seven days. It's all stuff that the union went and got that trickled down to the rest of the population. Yeah, we try to bring everybody up. Yeah. That's our whole goal. That's why I think you've always got to ask questions if someone seems to be villainizing uh, unions and the labor movement. Um, but speaking of casual, uh, casual work, let's talk about QP 1190, General Labor and Trades. Uh, they voted overwhelmingly to strike this year with major issues including wages and benefits for casual workers who represent about a third of the membership, I believe. Yes, correct. Uh, and I think negotiations were on hold uh, during the election. Uh, where are things at now? Uh, I know that uh, they are, again, cautiously optimistic that they're hoping that they're going to be able to get back to the bargaining table with the new government and that uh, you know the Treasury Board uh, will not be hamstrung like it was with the previous government because nothing was happening. Everything had to go through Mr. Higgs. Uh, we're hoping that this new government is going to respect fair collective bargaining and uh, address some of the issues that 1190 are facing. Mm -hmm. You know, They have um, many, many workers that, like you say, that are casual. They don't get the salary, they don't get the benefit, but even their full-time workers, like it's really important, this piece, you know, they have a lot of trades and they have a lot of people with many, many years experience. And the wages that were being offered by Mr. Higgs uh, would not, uh, you know, they couldn't, they just couldn't keep up. They couldn't take care of their families. They couldn't go. And so what was happening, they were causing, you know, all of this austerity has been causing the retention problem that we're having. When you have Red Seal tradespeople, not only in 1190, mm. but some of our other groups that are making five, six, seven dollars an hour less than they can in the private sector or whatever, there's got to mm. be some balance there. We don't begrudge the private sector. We think they deserve to make a decent living as well. But, uh, you know, this government really needs to come to the table. And we're, again, we're really hopeful that uh, they're going to be able to get a good financial package and, um, and we can continue building forward. And people often say that, you know, when you see this kind of systematic uh, underfunding of the public sector and you know, public sector jobs, it uh, reflects a deliberate strategy to weaken public services so that people turn around and say, better privatize that. And I think that we've seen that a lot in the United States, especially. <laughs> yes, we have. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, if you can break this system, then you're going to have to have someone come in and, you know, in, on that horse, you know, in knight in shining armor and save the world, right? Uh, meanwhile, they continue to make record profits. Uh, I've never seen the level of profits in the last four or five years that we're seeing from a lot of these large corporations and the CEOs. Like that gap between the working class and and uh, the ruling class has just gone crazy in the last four or five years. StatsCan just released a report on that here a couple of weeks ago. You know, and um, again, it's about fairness. And it, that's one place that Calipos is also attacking in this negotiation, new employees. They don't want them to be able to have the benefit until they work 2,000 hours. They're only offering them, there's two new classification that they want to make, and one is flex part-time, they call it, and they want to be, uh, they, they want to offer them a minimum of three hours a day, a minimum of three hours a day, but 
on the other end, they say, but if we need you for eight hours, you can't refuse. So how how do you have how do you manage a family life with saying I gotta go to work for three hours a day maybe that's all I'm gonna get, and but if they need me for eight hours I don't have a choice I have to stay there so if I have a family at home or anything like that, and the weekend delivery part timers that they want to create they're promising them a minimum of eight hours. There's nobody that can live on eight hours. So like he says the retention is not gonna be there. They're not going to retain. They're they're crying now that they're not that the our temporary employee that they they can't keep them that they, they they won't stay, and and they're working with the temp hours tremendously across the country, here in Moncton for the first six months or seven months of the year there was already seventy five thousand hours of temp hours. Those should be full time job. It's, it's not an exceptional year. It's like that year after year after year that they, 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 they count on part-time, uh, on, on, on casuals hour and temp hours. These should all be permanent jobs. I think this is what they call uh, flexibility <laughs> of, uh, lab of the labor, yes. Um, yes. labor force, right? Yeah, and we've, we've got a situation that's you know, very, very similar to that, and that's with uh, QP1253, and they represent our custodians and our school bus drivers, but you can turn on the radio every morning and you hear that this bus is late or this bus isn't running or there's something wrong, you know. You, know, um, you can't expect these, uh, you know. First of all, I wanted to say school bus drivers, they are actually delivering our most valuable resource as a nation to make sure that they get safely to and from school and they're professionally trained. But some of them are expected to, you know, survive on less than 30 hours a week mm -hmm. or six hours a day or four hours a day or whatever. It comes back to people need to have a full-time job and make real wages, you know, that can benefit, that can sustain them and not only them, but then they can contribute back to the family because that's the other thing, you know, you were talking about earlier, Lynn. When we raise our wages, we're not hiding all of our money offshore. We spend it at the local shops. We are the local economy, right? Exactly. We keep the local businesses going. And uh, so all of these myths that they are creating, you know, greedy unions and they're going to destroy the economy. Well, actually, um, I think it goes the other way around. Mm -hmm. You know, we contribute to our local economies. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, I was looking at the uh, latest offer from uh, CUPW and I think that it said f you're looking for minimum for 40 hours a week yes for, for rural yeah. and, and urban I believe. yes so in, in our contracts uh, we've been able to keep that we have job security we're one of the only one that hardly like it's very hard for the, the job security but we, we also look for full time whenever possible mm -hmm. like minimize the part time minimize the, the temps um, do you think that postal workers here in, in the Moncton area are prepared uh, prepared for a strike? Certainly is. They certainly are. Uh, every day I'm walking in the plant and they're saying, when are we going? Mm -hmm. When are we going? I can tell you that the other day we walked in the plant to show them, we said, let's make some noise so that it gets up to Ottawa that you're not satisfied with their latest offer. And the whistles, they started at 2 o'clock. At 3 o'clock, 3.30, I left the plant. The whistle had been going nonstop. We went back to greet the evening, the midnight shift that were coming in. And as we walked in at 9.15, they were, those whistles were still going. People day after day after day are saying, that we're ready, we want to go, we want to go. They're, they're ready. They've been passed over for many years. During the pandemic, we were called the heroes. And people are saying we were called the, the hero. Now we feel like we're zeros. Uh, during the pandemic, we decided not to the, 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 we decided to accept a contract with minimum, minimum, minimum percentage of increase, and, and we're due. We're, our salaries have not followed up with inflation. Mm -hmm. And that's like a North American trade a trend. I don't even know if it's global or whatever. But it's suppression of wages. This has been going on for thirty or forty years, if not longer. And uh, I mean, again, there's all kinds of evidence and research to say that. You know, I know when we were, you know. Uh, fighting with the previous government or whatever, we were using a lot of empirical data to show just how much that has happened, and then they'll come out and they'll offer the nursing home workers 10 cents an hour raise, you know, or maybe a 25 cent an hour wage uh, when their wages haven't kept up for the last 30 or 40 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's 
not only public sector, it's private sector, and, and, and God help you if you happen to be in a private sector with no union. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just don't know how families, well, families aren't. I, you know, I was going to say I don't know how they're making it. It's pretty evident they're not. You look at the food insecurity. You look at the housing insecurity. All of those social ills are because people, uh, you know, I think the common denominator in all of that is poverty. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got very, uh, you know, uh, planned by the other side that they want to make sure to keep people poor and desperate and do whatever they are told to do. Mm -hmm. And I guess your background gives you some insight into that from being, I believe, a social worker for, for years. Uh, correct. Uh, I did uh, frontline child protection and various other programs working with children and families for 32 years before I took on this job. And I did it in the greater St. John area. And it always was upsetting to me, not only as a social worker or, an, or a trade unionist, just as a human being, to see the level of ch early childhood poverty in New Brunswick. This goes back, you know, in the greater St. John area. Uh, there was at one point that 25% of the, uh, you know, children uh, in poverty under the age of five were in the greater St. John area. And I just thought, how is that possible when we have two of the richest people in Canada mm -hmm. living in St. John, but we have the highest rate of early childhood poverty? You know, there's something there. Mm -hmm. There really is. And it's gotten a lot worse uh, if you look at the people that are, you know, can't find a place to live or to rent. Uh, you know, uh, they're never going to have an opportunity to try and, you know, have their children, uh, you know, do extracurricular activities, maybe take your family on a, on a vacation or those types of things, you know. It's poverty, you know. They look at mental health. They look at addictions. I, you know, being a social worker, I had, had a lot of people, oh, those drug addicts and this, that, and mm -hmm. the other. And I said, you know, a lot of that are people who are unable to manage and deal with trauma, and there's no services in place, or very few. I mean, mental health has been stretched just like any other service, right? You know, and I think you deal with the poverty, there'll be less mental health issues and less addiction issues. You know, these ills are caused by greed at the end of the day. I, I often say to people when they talk about, because I, I work on St. George Street in Moncton, so yeah. uh, I always, as a, as a community, we fail these people. Like, it's, everybody has failed these people. Right. Because there's not enough fighting for these people and enough everything being done mm -hmm. for these people. You're bang on. Yeah. As totally a society, right. we have failed. Yes. And maybe that helps. I mean, I think that that definitely helps explain why some people, many people are, you know, uh, I guess I would say vulnerable to radicalization and, yeah, looking for someone to blame, scapegoating uh, immigrants, uh, uh, scapegoating uh, the poor, um, yeah, people who have drug addictions and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's blaming the victim, basically, is what it is, and uh, you know they're, uh, you know, the other side is extremely good at causing cultural wars and getting people to look in the wrong area in terms of what is the real problem here. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, just looking at the 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 Canada Post situation again for a moment, um, it's uh, I believe in 2011 and 2018 you had strikes, uh, if I recall correctly, rotating strikes. 20, 2011 we had rotating strike and then we got locked out uh, in tw uh, sorry 2011 we had uh, no overtime not working overtime and mm. Canada Post was saying that it was causing them so much trouble that they locked us out in 2018 we were doing rotating strike to make sure that the public would still be go getting their their stuff our fight is not with the public our fight is with the government mm and them not negotiating properly at the negotiating table and then finally they locked us out again in 2018 so at no point like in 2011 or 2018 were we not trying to service mm -hmm. the public and an important distinction to make there in terms of lockout versus strike which i think is often overlooked um uh so thanks for that and um you know, similar to what we saw earlier this year from Ottawa in the Teamsters dispute with the railway companies after they were locked out, again, uh, back to work orders, uh, back to work legislation uh, previously. Um, uh, are you concerned that the Trudeau government will, will resort to that again? I'm hoping they won't. Uh, I think our cards are in line in that with right now the infighting in between. He's a minority government. The difference in between 2018, he was a majority government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he mm -hmm. forced us back to work with the legislation. So hopefully with the minority government, it won't happen. But it's 
it's a it's a card that we have to turn mm -hmm. if it happens okay. and and hopefully he will let us negotiate because a negotiated contract is always a better contract mm -hmm. that is accepted more by the employee than a forced one mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people were surprised to see back to work, uh, a back to work order from minority government uh, this year, you know, supported by the ND NDP, with a government supported by the NDP. So, um, just a anything to, to add, Steve, about the, the current situation? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that the NDP have been very good at, you know, uh, and I know they're getting a blame for all of the problems that have happened with this Liberal government, but we've also had the greatest expansion of, this, of the social safety net underneath this. So, you know, Jagmeet Singh and his team have been able to make huge improvements. You know, you look at the dental care for families that can't afford it or seniors, you know, the pharmacare, and the one that's really pertinent to this is anti-scab legislation. Mm -hmm. You know, that was brought forward by the NDP to protect labor, right? And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's made its way through, but I can guarantee you, if a conservative government gets in, that'll be the first piece of legislation they get rid of. Well, anything else to add, uh, both of you, before we wrap up this edition? Lee and I wish you and your members 100% the very best, and I commit to you that uh, our 28,000 members will stand in solidarity with you, and I know you will also get that from National as well. I am on the National Executive Board, and that's some of the discussions. We always have those. When there's a labor group that's under attack, we make sure that our leaders and our members and activists know, hey, there's someone under attack here. We need to do our part to show our solidarity and protect labor and your workers. And, and same with you. Thank you very much for that because uh, as, as I talk, our allies are really what we need in this time and, and any time that you guys need it. We were there when uh, the school ones were uh, a couple of years ago and as you go along we will be there to support you too in your, your fight with the, the different level of government. Yeah, we can always count on that. We <laughs> always have the CUPW flag in the crowd with some of your leaders and some of your members at the, any of the uh, rallies or, or demonstrations we've held in strikes. So thank, thank you, you as well to you and your members. And David, thank you for this. Absolutely. Um, thanks for joining me today. Uh, Lean Doucette, president of CUPW Local 78, and Steve Dross, president of QPNB. Thanks again for joining us today for this edition of Labor Update.